Thanks, Olga. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Arvind Narayanan, who's also a professor in the Department of Computer Science here and sits uh, in the Center for IT Policy here at Princeton. Uh, he's done a lot of work on privacy, uh, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, among them, he leads the Web Transparency and Accountability Project here that discovers how companies can collect and use our personal information. Some of you re may remember as well that Arvind actually organized one of these CITP conferences a couple of years ago where we, t we had a panel on um, uh, tracking privacy algorithms and how we can figure out why someone is showing us the ads they are. And in fact, I think I showed one of those pollution videos that I showed you this morning at that very conference. So uh, Arvin has been working on this topic for a very long time. Today, he's going to talk to us about AI and fairness, which he's also been, been uh, working on and studying for several years now. Uh, so without further ado, thanks, Arvin. Thank you, Nick. Uh, is the mic on? Can you hear me? How about now? Yep. Great. Fantastic. Let's see if I can get this to show up. Interesting. How about now? Cool. Excellent. All right, I want to apologize to the photographer in advance because I tend to move around a little bit. Um, so I want to talk to you about AI and fairness. Let me motivate this in the following way. <laughs> Olga very nicely talked about some of the uh, concerns around uh, diversity in the AI workforce. But think about, is it possible that AI technologies can pick up some of these cultural biases and stereotypes. And then when you put AI to work in contexts like hiring, is it possible that AI is going to, in fact, perpetuate those stereotypes? And could that lead to unfairness and prejudice? So that's the topic of AI fairness. And people have been finding out more and more uh, that, in fact, not only is that possible, that we should think of that as the default. And I'm going to show you how and why that is. And also, my talk is titled, How to Make Progress on AI Fairness. I'll try to explain why I think we're not really making progress now and what we need to do in order to break through this deadlock that we have. So as I said, I want to convince you that this uh, uh, problem of bias in AI applications is the norm. It's the rule. It's not so much the exception. And I want to explain why that's the case. And I want to tell you why the current conversation is unproductively polarized and how we can hope for a middle ground to, to make progress. So you might know, I'm sure this has come up several times today already, that today's AI is fundamentally based on machine learning. This wasn't always the case, and this may not necessarily be the case a few decades in the future, uh, but that's how it is today, and machine learning is at the core of what has allowed AI to be so successful. But how does machine learning work? Well, in a sentence, machine learning is the process of discovering patterns in existing data, right, and applying those and reproducing those patterns when classifying new inputs. Now, if that sounds like a recipe for extracting and perpetuating bias, well, that's sort of the definition of machine learning, right? It's, it's very much part of the process. This is how machine learning discovers knowledge. And in the same process, it may also discover and perpetuate biases. And when we put machine learning to use in contexts involving making decisions about people, uh, whether it's criminal justice, uh, 10 million people per year are arrested in the US, and algorithmic decision making is involved in every part of the process, in bail decisions, in parole, in sentencing, and so on. Uh, and when you have decisions about credit hiring and so on, made based on data and algorithms and machine learning and AI, you have the issue that training data reflects human society, and so it captures the history of our own social prejudices, and that is reflected in the data that we feed into the algorithm for training, and that is also going to be inevitably reflected in the outputs of the algorithm. This is the general reason why AI fairness has become a major issue, and this plays out in slightly different ways in a variety of different applications. Perhaps the most famous example of this from last year was uh, an investigatory journalism piece by ProPublica. They looked at uh, something called Compass, which was a system for predicting recidivism risk of defendants in, in criminal justice. And specifically, what they found was that when you look at the false positives, that is, defendants who were falsely predicted to be at high risk but didn't, in fact, go on to reoffend, the false positive rate for black defendants uh, turned out to be twice the false positive rate for white defendants. 
it, the full story turned out to be more nuanced and complex than this, and I'll try to come back to that at the end if I have time. But this was a great example of how you have fairness concerns when you have algorithmic or AI-based uh, decision making. In other words, you can have a perpetuation of stereotypes against historically disadvantaged groups. And the same setting, this idea where you have a data set that represents how humans have made decisions over the decades. And then you use that data set to learn a score for each individual, whether it's a risk score or whether it's a score that represents uh, what sort of insurance rates they should get. This applies in a variety of contexts. We've talked about criminal justice. It's also in, in employment. It's also in credit and housing and mortgage and insurance and so on. The same phenomenon comes up over and over again. A lot of these predictive algorithms end up being pretty similar. But let me, let me now show you something that is quite different from this, how somewhat similar issues come up in a very different context. And this is online language translation. Let me tell you what happened when uh, Eileen, who's here, and Joanna, who's also here, and I wrote a paper looking at what happens in natural language processing systems. Uh, the paper was pretty general, but here is one example. This is what happens when you take a sentence in English, translate it to Turkish, and then back to English. Why Turkish? Well, one reason is that Eileen, who's the first author, is Turkish, so she thought of Turkish. But also, interestingly, Turkish has gender-neutral pronouns, the same pronoun for he and she. Watch what happens when I do this. I start from she's a doctor, he's a nurse. In Turkish, you have the same pronoun in both sentences. Back to English. Right, and it comes out the way that you would expect from the statistics of the English language. The system has seen this kind of sentence more often than that kind of sentence, and of course, it's gonna prefer this. In a way, it shouldn't be a surprise when you have a system learning from past data and trying to reproduce those patterns. Of course, this is what will happen. I'm not necessarily blaming Google here. Same thing happens with Bing, uh, uh, almost any of the online natural language translation systems. But this might be a surprise to you. You might not have expected this. And you might think uh, maybe things should be different. It's not even obvious what you would do differently, but it's food for thought. Here's another example. There is a computer vision-based app called uh, FaceApp, which has a number of interesting photo filters based on neural networks. And one of those filters was a hot filter. So what do you think the hot filter did? Of course, as you might expect, it lightened people's faces. It turned out, <laughs> this was not because somebody had programmed it in, it was simply something that it had discovered from the data, a pattern in the way that people had previously rated the hotness of images. And so it automatically discovered that and reproduced it. So here, the concern is a little bit different from the criminal justice example. The concern is that there's going to be a perpetuation of stereotypes. Right? For, for decades, we've criticized the media often for exactly this kind of thing, looking at the prejudices, or pardon me, the stereotypes in society and reflecting that in the way that uh, uh, we create uh, you know, uh, media and films and so on. But now the worry is that when you have AI doing things like text and image search, automated language translation, or voice assistance, when AI is the way that you interface with the world, right? Uh, when AI helps interpret the world for you, the worry is that all of these stereotypes that it's picked up from the data are gonna be reflected back at you. So because of the acknowledgement of these issues, there have been a lot of concerns and there's been a lot of activism to get uh, tech companies to change the way that they do things. And it's good that this conversation is happening. But I want to deliberately oversimplify things a little bit and I want to present a caricature of two different views or camps that have emerged here. This is a caricature and I'll admit that right up front, but I think it's going to be useful for us to make some comments about what's going on today. One extreme of this, you can imagine somebody who's a technologist at a tech company saying, oh, well, all that's going on here is that AI reflects society's biases. That's not our problem. If and when society overall becomes less prejudiced, then the behavior of AI technologies trained on that data will also change. That's one view. Another view among activists, for example, would be to take a strong stance against this to say technologists have proven irresponsible stewards of you know, having all of these decision-making power in their hands uh, and the automated decision-making is inherently very dangerous, out with it, we shouldn't have this in our society. Again, it's a, it's a deliberate oversimplification, but hopefully it'll be useful. So 
let's address these, these two extreme views, and then I'll tell you why I think because of the polarization, we're not having a very productive conversation today, and how I think we can take a middle ground. To technologists who say it's not our problem, I would say this. Technologists must bear responsibility because of at least four reasons. First, I ask, so what if AI biases come from human data? Nobody is forcing technologists to build AI by looking at, uh, you know, by using machine learning technologies that look at human decision making. If you've chosen to build things that way, then you must bear responsibility for what comes out of that. If you want to reap the commercial benefits of it, you must bear at least partial responsibility along with the users of these systems for the types of decisions uh, that these algorithmic systems tend to make. And the second thing I'll say is that, sure, biases might come from the data, but often machine learning can amplify these biases, as we're finding out through new research. And third, whether we want to or not, it is, it is simply uh, the case that AI has a veneer of objectivity in our society. Right? And we tend to often give more weight to AI-based decisions because it seems like it's all just math, it's objective. Uh, that's perhaps a type of bias that we have in our minds, but it does tend to compound the problem. And fourth, I would say, with human decision-making systems, we have a lot of legal mechanisms for oversight and due process. And similarly, we need that kind of infrastructure for automated decision-making as well. We don't quite have that today. We don't have those interfaces between the tech world and the situations in which these technologies are deployed. So that's one half of it. To an activist that says automated decision-making is inherently too dangerous, here's what I would say. I think we risk throwing out the baby with the bathwater by reacting too strongly to what is going on. Uh, and in fact, there are reasons to believe that automated decision making can be more transparent than human decision making. And this is something I can go on about, uh, but I'll give you just one example of this, of how subtle and complex some of the uh, biases in human decision making might be. There was a paper out of LSU by uh, economists that looked at how judges make decisions. And one of the things they found is that if the a college football team, if where a judge went to college, lost their game the previous night, then the defendants about whom the judges were making decisions statistically faced a, a, a lower odds of uh, getting favorable decisions. Right? And it, 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 it's tricky to do this kind of research. You have to uh, adjust for all kinds of statistical confounds, but it's a very detailed paper. I think it's really well done. Um, uh, and there are many, many results like this. So uh, human decision making can be very biased and uh, unpredictable and complex. An opportunity that we have with automated decision making it's not automatic, but if we do it right, the opportunity that we have is that all of the data and the decisions are out there for us to examine. We can, in turn, use automated tools to better understand these decisions and to measure biases, understand uh, what is going on, and try to build tools uh, so that we can make decisions in a more fair manner. We have that opportunity for transparency. But, but that opportunity is not always taken. Let me give you uh, a great example of this from a New York Times op-ed a couple of months ago. Here was the headline. And I, I don't want to blame the article author too much. You know, headlines are written by the editor, blah, blah, blah. But uh, here's what the headline said. Uh, when a computer program keeps you in jail. I was very curious about this. This is an example of you know, the concerns that people have about automated decision making, period. The idea that a computer could be making decisions about, about you in a, in a life or death or a freedom or not a situation is very, um, is very concerning. But when you dig deeper into this, here's what I found the article is actually saying. It turns out that private firms are developing these sentencing algorithms, right, and then claim that there are trade secrets. And so not only are they not available for defendants to examine, they're not even available to the judges to examine in many cases. That's the situation we're in today. This is pretty much the norm. So the real issue here is the lack of transparency around the decision making, not the fact that a computer is making the decision. In fact, again, as I was saying, we have the opportunity for this kind of decision making to be more transparent than what a human judge would be doing. 
So I want to claim that there has been a polarized conversation about this. And lest you think that I'm attacking two straw men, this deliberate caricature that I made, I want to say that this polarization has had real consequences. And one of those is that the level of uh, criticism that companies are getting rightly in many cases, but uh, for, you know, for whatever reasons, this has tended to make companies less transparent because there is a big disincentive against transparency because often when companies are forthcoming with their data and uh, what is going on, you know, many of these biases are inevitable when you're learning from human data. And because of the blowback they're getting, they're uh, deciding that the best strategy from a PR perspective is to not make any uh, information publicly available. And this actually really hurts research. As a researcher, I often really want to get a better scientific understanding of what's going on. Why did a particular type of phenomenon happen? And all we have to go on are occasional press reports that get blown up into big stories. Uh, we don't have a good idea of the prevalence of some of these adverse issues, for example, uh, and a lot of knowledge that uh, companies could potentially make available that would be scientifically incredibly helpful. <laughs> And let me give you one example of that. This is something, again, that you may have seen in the news from a couple of years ago when Google Photos labeled images of a couple of people as gorillas. Right? Really, really unfortunate. And they got a lot of pushback for it. But here's what I want to claim. We are very far from a scientific understanding of what is going on here. Uh, many people, when they look at this, they think they know, oh, it's obvious this is what's going on. Now, some previous people were racist and they labeled um, uh, you know, me, uh, as gorillas, et cetera. But, but the real narratives are much more tricky than that. Olga and I, for example, with our research groups, have a research program to going on uh, to, to understand certain really bizarre behaviors of computer vision algorithms uh, when applied to images of people. Um, I'm going beyond this example, really. And let me tell you, I mean, we're, we're pretty far from understanding what is going on here. We have some explanations, some hypotheses, but I think for the community to really fully understand uh, what computer vision, for example, is doing uh, when you give it images of people, it's going to take us 10 years. It's going to take us more than that. So I think we need patience. Uh, for, for a while, we're going to keep having these examples, and uh, we don't have good solutions in these cases. Um, what companies like Google tend to do in this situation is stop gap solutions. For example, nothing can be labeled a gorilla anymore by the algorithm, even actual gorillas, right? So that was the solution in this case. Uh, you open up your Google Photos app, you can't search for the word terrorist. That's not a search you can do anymore because it was turning up results that are, w would be predicted by prejudices in our society. Um, uh, uh, often it, the app was labeling people as dogs and so the solution was to make a new category called people and pets and whenever the algorithm is the slightest bit unsure it would just put it into the people and pets bucket in order to avoid causing any offense. Instead of really understanding what's going on and, and having real scientific solutions for uh, fixing these biases. So here's my proposal. I really think we need a middle ground. And let me explain what are some of the components of this middle ground approach. The first component that I think we need is we need to start separating the descriptive from the normative. We need to start separating what is from what ought to be. We need to separate the understanding of how these systems function to our goals for where we want these systems to get to and how to get there. And that might sound a little bit abstract. So let me give you an example by coming back to the Compass recidivism prediction instrument that ProPublica analyzed. Right? I mean, it was a fine piece of reporting. I don't have any criticism of that. But in hindsight, knowing what we do now, if we were to do it again, here's what I would have asked for. It would have been nice to have an objective analysis of what are the false positive rates in Compass and separate that from the questions of, is this morally acceptable or not? And further separate that from the question of, should we be even using automated decision making in the context of criminal justice? These are three separate questions, but they've been rolled together into one big hairy mess in the public conversation. And it's hard to have a stance on one of these without automatically somehow having a stance on the others, which is really unfortunate because one is a mathematical question and the others are moral questions and engineering questions. And let me explain what I mean when I say one is a mathematical question. Barely a month after uh, uh, the ProPublica article came out, several groups of researchers were surprised by what is going on. And uh, you know, Compass had a rebuttal to the article saying, no, we're not biased because 
here, here's, here's our version of the data. You know, it, but it, it's just uh, data and it's just math. So researchers wanted to take a look at it. And what they found surprised them. Several groups of researchers proved variants of a theorem that basically says that there are multiple notions, notions of fairness that you can want here. And it's mathematically impossible to satisfy them simultaneously. That sounds really surprising, right? A very crude version of this theorem, this is the best I think I can do without resorting to math here. A crude version of this theorem is that there is a notion of individual fairness, treating different individuals uh, the same, if they are the same on all observable characteristics. And there's a notion of group fairness, which is that you shouldn't have disparate impact, for example, in terms of false positive rates between different social groups. And it turns out you can't have both of these at the same time. It's completely crazy, it's very unintuitive that math can be in the way of our efforts to achieve basic social justice, but it is. And the crazy, there are two crazy things about this. Nobody had realized this until these concerns came about with respect to you know, using machine learning for making these decisions. And the even crazier thing is that the impossibility theorem applies just as well to human decision making. And nowhere does it say that this is a property of machine decision making. Right? This is a fundamental trade-off. It means that in the decades, in the centuries of human judges making these decisions about defendants, the same impossible trade-off had existed all along. It's just that nobody had noticed because nobody had the data to analyze and to take a look at. Right? So I would argue that this whole story, if anything, can be seen as an argument for automated decision making because that's what allowed us to discover this. Now, we could take different stances on that, but I was uh, being a, a bit provocative there. Uh, but this is what I hope for, right? Separating the scientific understanding of uh, what is going on, what is even possible from the normative questions of where should we go uh, and the engineering question of how do we get there. So, uh, to summarize all that, here's what I think we should do kind of from a policy perspective as outsiders looking at tech companies, uh, perhaps as researchers, as activists, as ethicists, as policy makers uh, who, want, who want things to uh, move in a direction for the better. I think we should definitely continue to push for diversity and transparency. Those are great. And we should go so far, I think, as to applaud companies for transparency efforts, even if the results of those efforts, even if the data that they produce uh, aren't necessarily what we want to hear, even if it shows that there's a lot of ground still to cover when it comes to AI fairness. I think we need to have that level of tolerance in order to incentivize companies and create a positive feedback loop when it comes to transparency. That's not quite the situation we're in today. And simultaneously, I think we should acknowledge that these measures, while really useful, aren't going to fully solve the problem. Because what is still missing is a science of understanding why bias and unfairness in AI, uh, how does it arise, and how can we start to mitigate the problem. We're, you know, we're starting to get there. There's a new research community called Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency in Machine Learning, a really active area of research, but still, I would say, a long way to go. And finally, the policy piece of all this is that we desperately need oversight mechanisms for AI. And what do I, what I mean by this is, here's one example. Companies like Compass and, and tech companies who are building these solutions that are used in really consequential scenarios, uh, they've never seen themselves as having been in conversation with policymakers, with ethicists, to try to understand the normative stakes, right? To figure out what are the fairness definitions they should put into their systems uh, and how to analyze their data sources for biases. We don't have the structures in place for this. We don't have the structures in place to have external oversight and governance over these uh, decision-making systems. And that, I think, will take a long time. We need to uh, build those structures from the ground up. Uh, with that, I'll put these key takeaways back that I had at the beginning of this. And all right, thank you for listening.